you'd like to contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or get involved in the conversation on social media. Join the Pearl Jam Podcast community group on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Live on Four Legs Pod. That sounds about getting hit in the face, turning your cheek, and getting hit again. Come to think of it, all the songs are about that. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett. Fucking camera in the truck. Four Legs, a definitive live Pearl Jam podcast. And if you're listening in, some of you might have listened to the first episode that we did of this little mini series that we're doing. And this is all kind of within a bigger series called the Hometown Series that we've been doing all year. That's kind of focusing on the 30 year anniversary of Pearl Jam in Seattle and focusing on some of the best shows that they've had in Seattle. These shows that we've done. So if you're on Patreon, You've probably already listened to the first one, or you pause this right now and you go and listen to the first one. You listen to this linearly, and then you go back to this and you listen to this afterwards, because that's how we like to do things. Uh, you know, obviously do things in order, and, and yes, we made... We made this a little bit complicated for people and the people that aren't on Patreon will have to listen to this episode as it is and might not get the other one, but... I think you'll get your fill from this one because there's a lot of fantastic moments. This is the Moore Theater, the Piss Bottle Men shows from early Vitalogy, February 1995. Let's get right into it. Randy Sobel over here, John Farrar over there. Hello. And uh, so, all right, I, I, I think we mentioned in the other, the first episode, night one, that we were going to do a lot of repeating ourselves. So for those of you who listen to night one, this might be the time where you want to fast forward a little bit because we're going to talk a little bit about why they did the, these shows and uh, and what kind of came of them. So like what what was the whole idea going uh, going about doing these shows here? Yeah, they were they were considered sort of the warm up shows for the Southeast Asian, you know, Vitalogy, the surfing tour. That, that Pearl Jam did. And we covered some of those when we did our Around the World series. And yeah, it was just kind of an excuse for Ed to to go surfing in places. And well, you know, a lot of these that tour's covered on the on the movie. If people have seen the movie, very, very cool. Um but yeah, these are kinda like a kind of a send off kind of uh kind of shows like, you know, give everybody a chance to see them before they're gone for a long time. Yeah, and uh, you know, Pearl Jam at the time, Vitalogy came out in like late November of 1994. So this is like, this is one of the first times, one of the first opportunities to see them. They did uh, self pollution radio, which obviously everybody has a great memory of. And Iconic. Uh, yeah, right. It's, it's one of the, one of their best, like, I don't even know if you call it a performance. I, I think it's more of like performance art in a way, but it's definitely one of the best, one of the best things that they've ever done. One of the best ordeals that they've ever put out. Um, okay. uh, and that kind of led way into a vote for change show that happened or two of them, I should say that happened in constitution hall in Washington, DC. 
And uh, that sort of kicked off, you know, obviously some of these songs were played in 1994 and had a life before this, but this kind of kicked off the, the, the tour with Jack and, and, you know, the way that Jack would kind of mesh and gel with the band. And, and these shows that came probably a week after the Constitution Hall shows was just, I, 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 I said in the last episode, it was a way to get Jack kind of familiar to the Seattle crowd and sort of introduce them to them. Yeah, just kind of get a feel for how he was going to sound with them and how, you know, kind of the logistics of this, the stage thing is going to work. Like, what's it going to be like? How's he going to, you know, I'm sure they, they've they been holed up in Seattle, obviously, for self-pollution, doing rehearsals and stuff like that. So they they were kind of getting to know each other a little bit. But you're never sure how that stuff's going to work until you get on a stage in front of people. Right. Yep. And there's going to, you know, he has songs that that are going to work differently than they work with Dave. And uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of things that, that need to be worked out. But also uh, another interesting aspect that I mentioned, they, they call these the piss model men shows. Well, why? Because so let's let's kind of think of the time period. So I mentioned Vitalogy. By this time, it, it had sold over four million copies. So it has gone quadruple platinum if if you want to put it on on a merit scale uh I, I don't care about those things i don't think people should but that's that's where it was at the time if you want to look at where numbers were so i, I was one of them i i wish i was i i i, <laughs> I think my dad bought it a little bit later but uh yeah. no I, I was not part of that until later uh so the piss bottle men thing it you know you have this sort of moniker, the pseudonym, because with all of those people, especially people in Seattle that just want to be around Pearl Jam and be part of what's going on with them, there's a lot of hype around them. You have to use kind of a different moniker. So if you put Pearl Jam on the marquee of the Moore Theater that holds like probably less than a thousand people, then you're going to have swarms of people just trying to break oh, yeah. in. There, there would be riots. Yeah. Right. So they went with Piss Bottle Men, which is a ref- reference to a Mike Watts song that was on Ball Hog or Tugboat. So uh, that's kind of a tie in with, with Ed and his uh, co- contribution to the album there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've seen that before. We've seen that before with uh, the Slim Show, David J-, J-, J Gun Band that they did at Slim's. Right. Uh, uh, another, another one that, that I was able to think of, uh, Santa Cruz in 97, they were the honking seals. So this is, you know, this, this is a practice that they've, uh, they've put forth before. So if not to, to, uh, detract attention to the venue. Yeah, I think, and, you know, I mentioned this too, they, I think they, they got this idea from REM, you know, I remember you know, REM is famous for the, like the bingo hand job and all that stuff where they would play in Athens under assumed names. And even when I was there, like in the late nineties, early two thousands, they, you never knew, like if, if there was some random band, you, you might, you might want to show up because it might be REM, you know? So was, I think they, they, you know, they were, they were friends with those guys by this point. I think Peter Buck moved to Seattle, I think in 95, 96. So yeah, I think uh, that that was kind of taking a page out of their book. Makes a lot of sense. Makes sense to me. Um, before we get into the show, um, there was some news within the last week, and maybe we can address it because it kind of does go in with you know what we do on the show, and it's talking about touring and it's talking about the the shows, and uh, we officially got the postponement for the European tour within from this episode and the last episode. So uh, we all saw it coming. We all knew it was coming, and and I think that it's it's the best plan for everybody to just have this done in 2022 and uh and not have to worry about and and we can kind of gesture by that point that everybody that needs to be vaccinated is going to be vaccinated and it's it's going to be a good thing but uh also that kind of came from it that i i want to bring up was that they uh they issued a free version of the Hyde Park show so I wanted to see if you got a chance to to watch any of that I have not had a chance to see it and yeah I know that that's a that's a really good show I think there's an of the earth at that show which is really good I think they they previewed that on their social media a couple times but yeah but I I definitely want to because it's it's a great show just looking out in the crowd and seeing the sea of people and I I can imagine I know so many people that had tickets for for that show and I, I i believe i believe there were was a second night added to it so like you know imagine <laughs> it's kind of a nightmare looking at that crowd now and and seeing the hundreds of thousands and after covid like you're 
no, this this cannot happen, unfortunately. But uh, it's it's a sight to behold. It really, you know, I I had the um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers Hyde Park DVD when I was in high school, and remember watching that and seeing those panning shots from the crowd that's starting from the back of the crowd going all the way to the stage, and it felt like, man, it felt like it was lasting forever. That's how incredible that is. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's up for free. So if you haven't gotten a chance, I I, wa- I was able to watch the main set before we started recording tonight so yeah yeah i think stuff. it's one of those where it's like it's at least like eighty thousand, ninety thousand people yeah, very close to a hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah yeah now we really have something to look forward to now there's like i i think this is going to be pretty much set in stone and and pretty much definite here so you know yeah. let's yeah. uh let's just move forward and and keep doing our thing and keep doing the things that we got to do and now we have stuff to actually look forward to 2022 if 2021 is not the year at the end of the year then maybe 2022 will just be the year so fingers are crossed yeah. Yeah, I think this is definitely not going to be the last announcement we get this year as far as something, as far as shows go. Right, and that could be either in a positive or negative direction. They still have uh, See Here Now and Ohana to announce. And, um, you know, from from things that I hear, it might be looking pretty positive for both of those shows. But Yeah, we'll see. We will see, right. And if there's anything to come afterwards... I, I have no idea. I can't predict that, but we'll we'll see what happens there. So uh, back in 1995, they had no idea that there would be a pandemic coming in, in 27 years. But uh, that's that's the nice thing about not not knowing what what where the future holds. So uh, and it's not 27 years, it's 26 years. So look at me doing math again. Uh, but the way that they're going to kick off night two is with release. And, uh, you know, usually they're kind of in a groove where anytime they do a night two show, it's going to start with release. And, and, you know, this is kind of no different. And, you know, I kind of got the sense of this being like a slower version than usual. And it didn't really pick up speed until, like the right when it gets into I'll ride the way wave, wave where it takes me line and then you get like a massive crowd reaction that kind of takes it but it's 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 definitely a slower build than usual versions yeah I think the you you, you hit on it. I think that's with Jack he's gonna emphasize more of that build than than Dave would I think that's and I, I don't obviously or I don't always associate the word kick ass with release but when it when it breaks through at the end, it, it is a kick-ass version of release. this a million times when we talked about it on night one but 310 songs and very late in the set all 310 songs that were played from night one were deep in 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 the bottom of the set and and release was obviously not one there's of only them, so. only two in this one right 310 uh, era songs but two songs from the album yeah i believe you're right yep that's kind of where they are at the time where they're just not you know, they're thinking forward, they're thinking ahead, they're thinking about Vitalogy and what they have with Vitalogy, and a little bit less about the past and, and 10, and, and this is the cr- kind of crowd that you could do that with, because they probably, being fan clubs and being fan, uh, did I even mention that for this? Hmm, I don't remember. <laughs> we might have, we might not have. <laughs> uh, mind, mind us, because yes, we, we have recorded another episode. So the way that people got tickets for this show, you had to be a fan club member and be local. They sent free tickets out. So, you know, it was kind of a spontaneity thing and, and uh, people got to go to a free Pearl Jam show. So, uh, you know, there, there you have it. And that's, that's the, that's the story of the piss bottle. And finally didn't, didn't mean to leave that big chunk out, but a 
especially for for the main version and not for the Patreon version. But there it is for you guys, in case you were wondering how people actually got into this show instead of you know just showing up and saying mm, "Piss Bottle Men." That that sounds pretty good. I'll I'll jump in on that. I don't think that there were anybody that actually did that because needed to be a fan club member. So, uh, okay, this is the sweet spot here where the Vitalogy songs all kick in. And the first, uh, the first night, they they start off with these three last eggs of Spin a Black Circle, uh, Tremor Christ, and then not for you and Corduroy would come later, but they're swapped. They're swapped uh, from from their night one placement. So let's focus on these three right now. You really loved the last exit version from night one, and it felt like night one, they came out completely juiced. And, you know, Jack was really setting a really fast tempo, a really fast pace, and these three songs were just full go. And in this, having these follow release, and maybe it was just having release there as sort of the lead into this, this felt like it was a little bit more honed in, a little bit like, you know, they were trying a different technique for this because... They were going out on tour in uh, Japan and and in Australia, and maybe they were going to do songs differently, and they still needed to figure things out with Jack. Yeah, it's not quite as balls to the wall as it is on night one last exit, but again, still very, very good. Don't get me wrong. Right, no. This is fantastic. Right, that's not a slight on any of the songs. It's just an observation. It's not the best performance ever of the song, you guys, so... Eh, take it or leave it. No, still very, very good up there for sure. I understood that reference. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, spin a black circle, like, in the pocket, maybe doesn't really ramp up and give you a ton of screaming from Ed. Like, Ed just kind of waits for his moments. It felt like in 93, 94, Ed is kind of just at every point in every song giving you his just loudest scream that he can. In these, he's kind of picking out the perfect spots here. Yeah, and I, I go back to the end of Spin the Black Circle 2 where Jack somehow ramps it up from where it already was at the end. Like, just ferocious, like almost like hardcore like style drumming on it. Just elevates the song like crazy, and that leads into Tremor Christ. And I I will, th- I will throw down the, the gauntlet. This is the best version of Tremor Christ I've ever heard. Wow, that is a statement. Yeah. Statement made. Gotta be. A booming rhythm, tribal-like, keeping the cymbals away from from the chorus and then bringing them in when that kind of musical uh, interlude comes in. Ah, oh, man. Wow. That This version of Tremor Christ is very... I love the, I love the last one, but I, I think this one was just as good. When you think of the song and you think of, you know, how the song has progressed over the years and sweet spot for it, yeah, it's right there. It's absolutely yeah. I think too maybe it's that this the audio on this one's a little better than on night one, but you can awesome. really hear like listen to Jeff and, and Jack playing together and it's it's magical. Like there's there's something special there. Corduroy went into Not For You at the first show. They're changing it up a little bit. Not For You is going into Corduroy here. With Not For You, especially a kind of a cool intro, too. Like, it sounded a little like they were trying 
not something drastically different, but it right. felt like they were kind of like leaning into it a little bit. Like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna push on this one a little bit, and you felt that like I talk about that kind of surge, where at the beginning of the song you kind of feel them kind of like pushing it, kind of like okay, let, let's make this something really cool. Yeah, these oh these these first five, and again that's that's you know the last text it's been the black circle not future of Christ. You know that one two three four off vitality. And then Corduroy, which they obviously knew was something special from the, from the first time they played it, to throw these in at this, at, you know, this first part of the show here is just, oh, this, this, this crowd must have been just knocked on their ass. And you know, it, it's funny because Corduroy was kind of unassuming at first. Like I, I don't know if it was just, and me and my my just I guess jaded mind with Corduroy just kind of forgets that when the song is is kind of in its chorus it it just sort of is what it is but it it just revs up and it bursts towards the end it just gets this like yeah yeah, mike gets a great solo in it the drums juice up but it kind of throws you for a loop a little bit because you know you're listening to the song and you're thinking all right well it's it's corduroy and kind of feel the flow of it but then when that kicks in like everything kind of changes It, it it definitely makes you focus your attention on it a little bit more that that part of the song was excellent I always go back to like, what if they had played this at Saturday Night Live instead of Not For You? Like, yeah. how insane would that have been? It felt like Not For You was definitely the song from the time, though. It was yeah, just... no, nothing, nothing wrong with that performance, don't get me right. wrong. Right, no, of but course Corduroy not. Is kind of, Corduroy's kind of turned into this, like, it's the iconic, like, you know, we did the, oh, yeah. we did the deep program, we voted it the best ever song. Like, it's, it's elevated to a point kind of beyond Not For You, and to go back to get like a Saturday Night Live version in 94 would have been really, really crazy. Yeah, and that's sort of what I was kind of getting at with just like, it's sort of being unassuming until the end when Mike takes a solo. I think it wasn't until maybe later this year that, that Corduroy became an expected show stop. Like, you get around the time that, that Soldier Field happens, the Soldier Field version oh, is yeah. very, very good. And I, I think Speaking that... best ever's. Right, I, 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 I think that they don't have it with Corduroy just yet. They didn't have it down in in '94 the same the same way that they do now, or the same way that they, they, they did with Jack. But it builds into that over time. I think yeah, that's it, what I'm getting into there. And that that intro became such a huge iconic thing. Like, yeah, oh my god! Like you knew once you heard that that like everybody's shit was clapping about to go down. and yeah. right jumping and and just waiting for that moment to just. Boom, burst right into the waiting drove me mad. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's that part is not quite there yet, but boy, give give him a week and it's going to be perfect. Lucan into Dissident and Lucan, like we mentioned in the night one show was a debut. And uh, of course, this is the second time they're playing it. So um, I guess it's kind of the same the same conversation that we had in the last one. Like, what the hell are the lyrics? What was going on? And it was just kind of this was at least shorter. This was 54 seconds while the other one was a full minute. repeat the conversation from the last time but like where is this song at this point yeah so it, it's not even called lucan yet obviously because there's no references to to matt lucan anything. or anything like yeah the, i think he even says oh this is a new one and i think this one even it's interesting because even from from the previous night there's even like a little bit of a different lyric to it like this one yes. I can distinctly here you can hear you know at the i gave you everything Standing in the doorway, this I, I call this kind of the "I gave you everything" version, right? Of of Lucan, because that's kind of the the main lyric that you can make out. But yeah, it's already has already changed even from the previous night. Very interesting, and I I like this version a lot. I I, I think this is one of the coolest Lucans. Interesting, yeah. I, I, I like I like the way the lyrics go. I like the flow of it. 
Yeah, and maybe it's just me, and maybe it's just a little bit tougher to decipher between the two. And and yeah, you can tell that there are different lyrics, but you can't tell really what they are. I heard the doorway line too, but I wasn't necessarily sure where he was going with that. Mm-hmm. So because it doesn't really have this like interest and spark like that other debut songs have that sort of start from the bottom, it's just... I don't know. I don't know where it is for me here. I, I, I just, it's, it's tough to, it's tough to put a finger on it because it's just kind of at the end of the day, it's, it's a 55 second version of Lucan and uh, all mm-hmm. right, on to the next thing. And but this is, this is kind of something we, we, we kind of mentioned a few times, but like that was where they were in the, in the early to mid nineties. They were pushing forward with new music and yeah, you're getting a new song here two months yeah. after the release of your album. Like we go back and you, know, you go back there, they were playing leash. They were playing all these, you know, whipping started really early. We mentioned better man started really early. 93 all through you know, 93, you get debuts of last exit and tremor Christ late where they're previewing those songs like a year before the album would come out. And here already you're getting a song that went up on no code, which isn't even in, in anybody's radar right yet. like here they they're just about to go go on tour for the latest album and you're already getting a song that's going to be on the next one so yeah again they, they felt like they could do that because and you know we don't get that anymore because you know nowadays everybody's got the cell phones every they know that any new thing they do is going to be on youtube immediately and everyone's going to have it and i think jeff has gone on record as saying like that's why they don't do that anymore sure that and that makes a lot of sense i yeah you know more power to them uh yeah. dissonant to follow i didn't have anything specific on dissonant it yeah, didn't feel like pretty good it didn't feel like ed brought a lot of power to those vocals that he usually mm. did like it, it seemed like maybe it was a take it or leave it for them at the time with, yeah and again, I, I, just, I just don't know yeah again with jack like we i don't know how how much he was really feeling those songs like you, you know i gotta think they were when they got jack you know whenever you have a new drummer especially that's you know they talk about how that's kind of replacing the heart of your of your band so they've obviously going to go to him and be like let's i think i gotta think they worked backwards like let's get the vitality stuff done then let's work back and see what we know what we can get from versus what we can get from 10 and they were still probably throwing those songs in so yeah they probably hadn't rehearsed these as much as the as the vitality songs right right yeah i think at this point i had made a, a note here saying that vocals on night one feel so much better so much more raw on vocals on night two this you know again i use that word honed in a little bit and maybe it's just trying different techniques for the way that they want to utilize these songs for the future and i think we've seen them kind of have a little bit of uh of a reserve nature to them but also like last exit and spin a black circle where they're just full fully out there with them so it, it seems like they they definitely had an agenda out there this night so we we talked about new stuff. We talked about Lucan and uh, I don't even know if Lucan is the most brand new song of, of the bunch because right here we have active love. time i think right in, in the middle of this they're they're recording mirror ball up in uh, up in seattle and they had played it at the constitution hall shows and they had also played it at neil's a rock and roll hall of fame ceremony so this had been around a little bit and i wonder how many people had heard this at this point yeah I, I don't i don't think anyone had heard it okay yeah. Where, was the rock and roll hall of fame not like a publicized thing at the time was it I not don't think so. televised I, I don't, 
Yeah, even if it was, it was like a like it was not like an HBO thing where like yeah. hardly anybody had access to it. They probably didn't even show the whole performance. It's right. like an edited thing, so I, I doubt this was even shown. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So, all right, but you know, <laughs> Act of Love is a very huge talking point of the show. It's this is not the last time that we talk about Act of Love. So there is a bit of a reprise that that comes later in the set, but. As far as performance goes, this was this was great. It was it, it felt like it was the go-to mirror ball song for them in at least in the '95 and then kind of later in '98 as well when they yeah. they brought it back at Constitution Hall in '98. Uh, and then later on, they would they would start playing Throwing Hatred down a little bit more. Where that even up until the the Home and Away shows that kind of became more of a staple here too. So the only sort of thing I had on it was just that they they were kind of in it and they were just kind of feeling it and uh, yeah, they didn't really seem to know how to end it. But maybe right, they needed yeah. somebody's help. It does kind of fall apart, yeah, at the end. And but but not bad considering it's like. It's the third or fourth, whatever we're going to call it, depending on whether you're going to want to throw in that that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame performance. You know, still, again, like, and again, you're you're getting a song that's that people don't know, a new song, and people are like, why are they playing a new Neil Young song that he hasn't even played yet? Like, right. What's, but I think, you know, and, you know, we mentioned there was, there was kind of a, an MTV, you know, review of this, and pe- people knew that the, that the Mirror Ball record was happening. Like, it was... It was out there that, that Neil was recording with them, so we kind of knew that that was happening. So maybe it wasn't quite of a, of a head scratcher, but still, you know, for it being like an early performance of this, very, very good. Absolutely, yeah. It'll be fun to talk about the difference between like the Ed vocals and the Neil vocals in this too, because they have two kind of different approaches to it as well. So maybe we'll save that a little bit for uh, for later when the reprise comes into play. Uh, Animal, State of Love and Trust, you're off of the Vitalogy songs for a nice little chunk here, and now, like, this is, this is Versus and Ten Era, and Animal, I think we talked about it on night one, was about two and a half minutes and felt really fast, but this one, this is a fucking, like, the blistering solo that extends, it extends, like, deeper, deeper into that chorus and kind of goes right up until that, like, that final stanza where they go back into the opening riff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's when you know that Mike is feeling it, when he just, that solo just doesn't stop. Yeah, you'd, you'd see that, you know, throughout there, you know, you go throughout the history in 2000, 2003, and so on, that that shows up when he's when he's feeling in a mood. Absolutely. And yeah, this is, this is one, I mean, you know, the 93 VMAs animal is obviously, like, one of the greatest, but this is, this is a really, really good animal, one of the, one of the best I've ever heard. Jack era animal yeah, up there. Yeah, absolutely. See, we came up with this idea of playing a game called Matt Jack or Dave and throwing like a song Mary out Kill. there. Fuck Mary Kill, right? Uh-huh. The, the way that you say it is kind of like Fuck Mary Kill. Uh, but uh, what you do is you just throw a song out there like Animal's a perfect example because all three of them played an Animal a lot. So you have a lot of versions to go off of. Which one would be your favorite? That's an idea for the future, perhaps. So. Keep that in mind if you're interested in ideas. Maybe we'll get some. Maybe we'll get some guests for that. We get some. We get a really. We can get someone who's a really Dave A person. Oh. Someone who's a real. Who's a real Cameron person, and we'll uh, we'll maybe uh, make a little game show out of that or something. All right. Hey, you heard it here first. If you're if you're up for participating, you know how to get in touch with us live on Four Legs Podcast right. and Gmail dot com. So uh, let's let's continue on into State of Love and Trust, and uh, you know. This one kind of started off kind of weird. You know, Ed comes in, the vocals are just way too early. They don't allow the drums to come in and open up the song. It's just kind of that opening riff. And then before that drum section kind of gives you that second part of the opening riff, Ed comes in right away. So it just feels a little janky in the, in the middle here. But boy, when they get into this, this like, this drum part, I'm, I'm not sure what to even think about this because... Don't get me wrong, Jack is insane, insane here. But is State of Love and Trust a song that you want to pull something like that out? I mean, I can see where they were trying something out with it, but yeah, we used to call this cut time. I mean, he's playing like a punk rock beat. This is like a kind of, it's an epitaph kind of fat record. Yes. Punk rock beat. Right. That he's playing on it. And... It's definitely weird. It, I don't know if it fits the song or not. I have I listened to it a couple of times, and you know, I, it's just it's almost so strange that you can't wrap your head around it. You know, State of Love and Trust, as played by 
no effects or something. But <laughs> just the fact that he can do that, like play a completely different beat to it, and it still maintains the like basic integrity of the song, is something to be said for sure. Like it's it's unique and it stands out for sure. Yeah, you know there are some some of these songs that weren't written and developed by Jack that just are instant Jack songs. Last Exit, Go. They're the ones that come to mind. Uh, Immortality, they're the ones that come to mind. State of Love and Trust, I think, at the early stage was not necessarily one that Jack was, you know, jumped right in and he was accustomed to. This was really only a one-time thing. I don't remember any other version that he's played like this. No, yeah, I I can't think of it either. And this is the kind of song where if something is different, it stands out. It kind of takes your attention, so... Yeah, he'd obviously figure it out, and uh, and he'd get to it at some point. But you're, you're right that this is this is very no effects kind of bad religion like this. This is epitaph, and I've been listening to a lot of epitaph bands for the last yeah. you know a couple weeks or so. So yeah, right right in that wheelhouse. Uh, before daughter. All right, so we get. I, I don't know if if you were going to make this a storyline. I'm about to, but we get a young lady in the crowd who's screaming out for footsteps before daughter hits. That's not the first time we'll hear her. That would have been fun, but I don't think she got her wish at this show. But we do get to hear her a couple times. She does come back. Uh, And I think that just goes to show how few people that are in the crowd that the tape could pick up on something like that. Yeah, she's immortalized just because she was standing next to the person who was taping. Exactly. Yeah, just got to be the lucky person on a lucky night. So Um, we talked about Daughter from the night before, and this kind of... WMA was also played the night before, which is an amazing standout from night one. So Daughter Night One was just, to me, it felt a little, I guess, bland. I I guess it just didn't have that build into the song. And then instead of doing a tag, it just kind of tapered off a little bit. But this actually has kind of more of a bite to it than the first version. And Ed kind of lets his vocals really kind of belted out like it's it's one of like i said he was honed in a little bit more like it feels like this is the first time since maybe not for you that he was really letting his vocals kind of soar in this and and i i i I enjoyed it i thought this this was much better than the night one version and again it's it's trying to figure out where you are with certain songs and how you're going to play them and uh obviously you know wma was was played in full it's tagged at this show, only the All My Pieces Set Me Free line, which is enough to consider it a, a WMA tag, but then you add in uh, the split ends on the end of that. Uh, stuff and Nonsense, which could be a a clue to maybe, uh, hey, if the split, if the Finns are in town, maybe that's a song that we can play with them. Oh, yeah. They, I think they definitely had those Australian New Zealand shows in, in their in their mind as to far as coming up. So yeah, a little nod to that. But I think yeah, that that WMA from night one was oh my god, like it, it's worth the the dollar a month on Patreon to join. Yes, listen, exactly. to listen to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that adds a little bit more of a bite to this one. And the the stuff and nonsense is great. That that's kind of that's again that's one that's kind of stuck in this era. I don't I don't think they they've broken that one out very often in the two no. thousands, but. Again, yeah, a a much, much better daughter on night two, I thought. Yep, absolutely agree with that. Something you don't get on night one pretty much at all, improvs. You get a lot of improvs at this show. This is the first one.
price of everything. And John, you had a little project that you worked on through Patreon. We, we do these episodes called Devo and, and the Devo. You did one that was kind of building a story within these songs from 1995 that weren't on Vitalogy and that they were pre-No Code songs. So what what do you have from this? Because this was part of that, right? I believe this was kind of like in that early part of your uh, your album that you created. It absolutely was. And that was one of the coolest things that I've that I think I've done as part of this show. Like I I'm still really proud of that thing. I went back and like what would what would a kind of a lost Pearl Jam album from 1995 sound like if they had if they had decided to kind of like capitalize on the momentum of, of Jack and the tour and like go right back in the studio like even bef- before No Code just not just go in and knock out another album real quick just to really do this kind of a thing and I kind of put together you know some of the early versions of songs like you know obviously the Merkin Ball songs you can throw in there some stuff they're playing like Brain of Jay um, the some stuff some Sun improvs burn. and Sunburn, absolutely. Some early stuff from No Code. I think Lucan and Habit were already broken out in '95, yep. mm-hmm. and I kind of weave together a story of like some some people on like a road trip, and it was kind of like a southwestern kind of feel to it. Like there was a the open road in Prague. Oh yeah, that's a opened it up. Phoenix. That's very very good. And I think this one was kind of midway through where they're kind of like they're on this trip and they're kind of like out of money and they're kind of wondering like trying to buy stuff but the every the price of everything keeps going up you know it kind of like it's kind of the middle section of it the kind of like what's going to happen like act two but yeah really really cool and i got something that didn't even occur to me like obviously dedicated to this this riz rollins person who works for record store and ed's talking about the price of everything going up i think he's probably talking about the price of records yeah the price of cds maybe you know cds were what 18.99 at this Ugh. point you know at at least so yeah, I think there's 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 a little bit of that in there too. But I, this is very well put together. I, I think even you talk about Stone dedicating it. I gotta think this is more than just an an improv. I wonder if this was something that they had maybe worked on for Mirrorball or Merkin Ball, or something. They even maybe a like a Vitology outtake that that didn't make the list that never got recorded. Just something they were just trying. But it it sounds very well put together for just an improv. You know, I, I you could have been reading off my notes because I have those those same points written right here. Uh, just like the way that Ed was doing that, like random chanting here and there, like it felt like that's kind of a thing that needed to be fleshed out and needed to be worked on. And it didn't necessarily feel like an off the cup kind of thing. So I think I'm with you. I, I think yeah. that they might've put this together at some point, you know, maybe if it was just like you said, just jamming on it during the mirror ball sessions or something like that. But Look, you would get a lot of great improvs in 1995, and, and you would mm-hmm. get great ones in 93 and 94 as well, but you're right. they It felt like they matured once they get got into all these different kind of sounds. And, you know, this one, to me, it sounded like almost like the beginning had like a, a dead man kind of vibe to it, and then it, when it transitions in to, I guess, what you would say, like the chorus or the bridge, it... it kind of sounds a little bit closer to what I, I'm open is. So it has, uh, you know, and both of those are, are kind of songs that, uh, that would come out of this time period. So I really enjoyed it. I, I thought this was, this was great. And it kind of, it does fit up there with the open roads. And and when I, I, I think of the improvs, I think of these as kind of being above stuff like fuck me in the brain and, and things like that, that are just, kind of they're they're the real ones that are off the cuff and anything any lyrics that are coming up to to ed's mind he's just gonna blurt them out it doesn't matter like this is this is definitely a sign of maturation with the band yeah and everybody knows falling down which was an ototo a lot of people know open road but this is one that i don't think a lot of people you know go back to you don't hear about it a lot but it's right there with those very very good and a perfect transition into whipping. Really, really mm-hmm. like that. Uh, good tie-in flow-wise, and whipping is right in the sweet spot of where I like it. It it has its groove without losing like that thunder sometimes when they're really speeding through it and just rushing through it. It's kind of imbalanced a little bit, um, but I, I love when it just it, it it can be fast. It can have a groove to it, and then. Uh, you can kind of get Ed on his vocals really shining on it too. Like he's, it, it felt like at this point in the set, some of those other songs, like I mentioned, Dissident, he didn't really have his top voice for. Ed is really shining out with, with, with his voice on this now. 
Yeah, I think whipping is best when it kind of like when it pulsates. When you there's kind of like a. That's, I, I think know, that's like, what I meant by groove. Yeah, making it like it, obviously it's you know in the lyrics of a uh, lyrics of vitology it's you know it's you can say it's about abortion and all of that like but it's it, there's it's it's best when it's got kind of a heartbeat to it and you can hear Mike doing his little guitar thing on it and it yeah the the groove kind of the, the pulse of it you can you can feel it like kind of going in and out and in and out it's, yeah it's a really unique song I think you, people kind of lump it in with those kind of fast punk rock songs but it's it's a little different than that it's got something a little extra I think it's an underrated song. Agreed, and uh, you get the chorus at the end where Ed's kind of adding in that embellishment. You can tell when they're feeling it. The whipping, ah, the whipping, ah. Like that, that, that's my appreciation on this for the week. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna get to my appreciation. That song is coming a little bit later. One that we definitely don't talk about at all, but uh, definitely like this version. And Ed right afterwards says that's a song about getting hit in the face, turning the cheek, and getting hit right again. And actually, all of our songs are like that, which is pretty true for for the vitology era yeah. did you, you hear what he said after that too uh i missed that because i was paying attention to footsteps girl footsteps! he says uh keep turning your cheek in the free world <laughs> yeah, actually, i actually did catch that i don't know why yeah. i didn't write it yeah <laughs> that's pretty good good line immortality coming in right here and the way you know when you balance the night the night one performances with the night two performances this is not you know hey all of you that that went to both these shows you're not getting the same versions of these songs and immortality night one kind of ends really delicately and kind of kind of beautiful in a way it doesn't have that bombastic drum ending this you know this is just a little bit crazier Once they get to the ending, like it gets a little, it has a little space before you get Jack to build into that moment. But man, when he does, that is a classic, classic moment. He's losing, he's losing control while being in control. And that's scary. Oh, scary. So, so fucking good. Like, again, the, we, we've talked about a lot of like classic immortality and immortality is almost in that conversation with Rearview Mirror and Black where like, there's not a bad version it's almost in that echelon of Pearl Jam songs. And this is this is a top five, top ten, I think, immortality. With I love the way Jack plays on it. I love the way he, he drives it and and just grooves on it. It's amazing. Like oh my god, so good. I love this. And the way that it's balanced too, it's not that like they don't end on this driving level. They they let mm-hmm. it kind of breathe a little bit. And then you listen to the end, you know? That's a little bit of shades of hard to imagine. I don't know if you heard that, but that that it fits note, the song so well. It really does, like, right? It's perfect for the song. Yeah, and it just again, it's the smooth plane landing that comes right in yeah. and works perfectly. Like, I I included this in my when I did the setlist draft and I did a little mini Jack set. Like I mm-hmm. included this song in there because he this is this is a Jack song to me. Like he is above and beyond on this one. You don't have to play Matt Jack Dave on the song. You, you, oh, thank you. That's the winner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. This is great. And this caught me off guard so well. I, I, It caught me off guard, especially this section 
is at the end of immortality. So you get a little kind of what's going on here, a little playing around, and then you realize, oh, that's the album intro to go. incredible didn't see it coming and it's a classic go performance to end the set mike just has one of these just raging just scathing solos here it's like eddie, eddie van halen on speed yeah exactly ed's vocals are just fitting perfect touch absolutely highlight of this night jack's obviously perfect on go i mean jack had done he had done an intro on, on night one, but I don't think it was exactly the album intro, but I think they, no. they worked on it and were like, Let, let's do it. And that right. they've done that a few times. Like, there was one show, I think, in 2018, where, or 2016 or 2018, where they did it, and it was like... I think it was binaural. They also yeah. did uh, Madison Square Garden the, the yeah. first night of 2016. And like, and that's such an iconic thing now. And like, oh, yeah. to get it to get it here is just yeah. Oh my God, amazing. Yeah, right. Another one, another one that that you give you give Jack the nod to. I'll give them all the nod. I, yeah. This is, oh, this is a band effort. Best. Yeah. Absolutely. So, all right, we're here at the Encore, which means one thing, it's time to pause for station identification. And a lot of this episode that we've been kind of talking about today, uh, for most of you that have been listening in uh, that aren't part of Patreon, this is sort of a part two to a two-part series. So you're kind of jumping into a lot of talking points and we've tried to keep the talking points from t- night one to a minimum and we apologize if we haven't, but there's a way to solve this problem and that's if you want the whole kit and caboodle here, we have night one over on Patreon, don't we? Oh yeah, and it, like I said, worth it for that version of WMA if nothing else. Absolutely. And look, you know that that's not something we do very often and we thought there's two shows we were going to originally do uh you know two weeks of this back to back but it just yeah, we we, we want to get to more stuff we're we're padding our stats this year we we've done tons of 91 stuff and there's lots of stuff to do so we just wanted to get another thing in for the patrons that are, are nice enough to donate to us so john um why don't you let everybody know we do this every week but why don't you let everybody know what's uh what's up with patreon what you can get from uh contributing to our little project that we have here yeah so if you're if you're not familiar with patreon it's just a way that you can support the show and you know get access to some of the cool things that we're doing we have different tiers if you uh, donate one dollar a month to the show you get access to all of the bonus content that we're doing all of the audio that we throw up there the bridge school series that we've been doing the evolution episodes which are fantastic they're a lot of fun we dig into a song and talk about its its evolution throughout the years we've talked about our our devo episodes where we kind of let our hair down and have some fun and do some different things talk about some uh, things we don't normally get to talk about and we and, don't have fun on the show that's why <laughs> yeah, it's right um and yeah just the set list drafts and everything we're doing over there you get a chance to listen to all of that it's all archived there for one dollar a month you can go check it out see if see if you're into it for five dollars a month you become a giga leg and that's if you've got like a Pearl Jam show that you feel is underrated. If you feel like, oh, there was a show that I went to that was great that nobody ever talks about. I want to hear them talk about that one. Or, oh, there's this classic show that they haven't talked about yet. I want to really want to hear them talk about that one. That's where you, you get a chance to request a show for us to cover. You can come on the show and talk about it. And, you know, that's there for $5 a month. You still get access to all the audio content. Everything's all there archived for you. Then we have our $10 a month tier, which is the Horizon Leg tier, which for the people who are contributing to our uh, Concertpedia project, liveonfourlegs.com. 
and you know you'll get like an executive producer credit on that because you know we're, we've got some costs now associated with that website going forward so that's ten dollars a month you get access to everything from the five dollar and one dollar tier still you'll still get to request a show you still get to come on we'll do a profile episode on you we'll talk about your history with Pearl Jam some of your live shows we've been doing those have all been great we've done I think five or six of them at this point they're all been wonderful we'll you know we'll have you pick a specific song we'll play it in full and yeah it's, we have different options so yeah check it out see what you think now is a great time to come in this is the first time that we've ever released two episodes simultaneously <laughs> so you can get you can get a feel for you know you get kind of double the episodes this week so now is a perfect time to jump on if you've been thinking about it yeah jump on the train wreck why not uh <laughs> no it, 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 it's great stuff and we really enjoy doing it and enjoy doing it for the people that uh love love intaking the content we we thank them and uh you know uh, we're on on this train here we're we're 90 patrons deep and we said it's it's the train to 100 we're we're gunning for 100 and once we get to 100 that's our goal and we're going to throw everybody a big party and once we throw that big party maybe we'll do some really cool stuff hey yeah. my uh my due date my due date for my baby just got pushed up <laughs> it got pushed like it, it just went to the front of the line like we were at yeah. we were at july 22nd maybe a little earlier than that and uh we just got pushed up to july 1st so yeah. we need to have this party sooner rather than later so that's not to push you if you know that's not to say like go join patreon now go jo- join patreon when it's convenient to you but uh if you've been thinking about it now is a great time to just jump in. And I always say this bonus leg, just jump in for a dollar. You'll get all the content and you'll even get a chance to, to join the setlist draft too. Like that's, I, I think that's a great uh, added bonus in with all of what we're doing. So yeah. And join our discord too. A lot of great conversation going over there on our discord. We just had, we just had the anniversary of Atlanta 94 went on mm-hmm. there and, and, Played that on the streaming channel for people. Got a chance to listen to that, so that was very cool. Yeah, a lot of a lot of cool stuff going over on the Discord. Definitely check that out if you're a Discord user. Yep, absolutely. Uh, hey, get in touch with us for the link. The link expires anytime we post it anywhere. So yeah, uh, you got to change it out every week or something. Yeah. Exactly. So just get in touch with us, and we'll uh, well we'll hook you up. All right, we are in the encore portion, the first encore portion of the show, and uh, you know this is this is nothing new to us now, but in 1995. When the heck is he ever coming out by himself with an acoustic guitar and playing? We talked about it at St. Petersburg, the end of the show, the elusive third encore. He comes out and he does throw your arms around me. But here we are. The kids are all right. Coming in right here. And it's just Ed. Solo acoustic performance. I love the performance of this. I, I, I think this is one of their like underrated covers that oh, they yeah. do. Absolutely. And I here's my, my thought on why Ed really started doing this at the time, because later on, uh, Dead Man would be written and he would he would start to do the pre the pre show sets, uh, playing either Dead Man or this or, or Cat Stevens or something else. And the reason why I think he, he's doing that because I, I I think he wants to almost sort of I don't, not put attention on himself but take himself away from the identity of the band and I want to think that Ed might just think that everybody in the band is super fucking talented and he wants to kind of have his own little spotlight to show hey I'm I'm getting the hang of this musician thing too I'm pretty good at this I need I need to have these reps in front of these people let's see what I can do obviously you don't get a lack of Ed moments at any Pearl Jam show, but this is kind of going forward. This this would be a more common thing, and, and you have to think that this was something that Ed really, he almost wanted to do it to prove, to prove he could. 
Yeah, even even more than that, I think it's just him wanting to kind of have just have some fun and just play songs that he loves for people. Like maybe a song that people like. You know, we talked about. You know, Night One has "Let My Love Open the Door," which is kind of a it's not an obscure thing, but it's but it's Townsend solo from the mid '80s. It was kind of a it's a different kind of a thing, and you know, I think it's just him like. Yeah, I can go out there and just play songs that I love for people that might be a little unknown, like might be a little bit under the radar. And Kids Are All Right is one of those where like it's it's kind of been overshadowed by your Bob O'Reilly's and even like Real Me and Love Rain Over Me and all these Who songs that they do now. But yeah, I, I love this. And this is, you know, it's I always associate this with, you know, there's there's kind of two kind of iconic performances of this that they did it on Atlanta Night One which was not on the radio in 94, but you know, you, that's a great version. And then the, the main one, like the Seattle 2000 one where the last show of that tour, right. They played. And I, that's one of the coolest versions I think ever, but this just add this to the list. Like, this is great. The bridge, the bridge school version of this, I, I believe it was 99. I, I really like that version mm-hmm. too. I thought that was fantastic, but yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite, uh, who songs. It's a very early song and I, 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 I love it. I love when they, they play it. It's not very often they do it. So, uh, this feel, this feels like a treat. This definitely feels like a little treat. All right. Ed said that it was dedicated to the opening band called Magnog. Your, uh, all your information that you can share about Magnog. Yeah, they were kind of uh, actually did find some information about Magnog. Okay. Um, they were kind of like an electronic kind of instrumental thing, and I think he mentions that they were friends with his wife. That so they yeah. they do kind of have a hovercraft kind of sound to them. You can actually go to magnog.bandcamp.com and download and listen to some of their stuff if you really want to get a feel. Like if you want to put yourself in the frame of mind for the show. You can go. You can go dial up some Magnog before you listen to this bootleg and really get a feel for it. But it's not bad. It's kind of that kind of mid '90s kind of spacey electronic stuff. Like I, it's not something I would like seek out. But it well, it's not terrible. All right. Well, he mentioned something about aliens, so yeah, I guess that that fits in with yeah. sort of the theme there. Yeah. Uh, guess who's back? Footsteps girl's back, and she ain't let it up. <laughs> She ain't getting her request. Now, I'm very surprised that Ed isn't at least hearing this and considering it. And maybe it's just due to the fact that, okay, we have a handful of songs that we want to practice with, with Jack. If we did footsteps, then yeah, maybe we'd consider it. But I, I, I don't think that that was really on the radar at the time. They, they played it in Osaka and in Australia. So okay, they didn't have to so wait that long. No. Yeah. No, yeah. not too bad at all. Uh, maybe she was he, at those shows. <laughs> Only if she got the free tickets in the mail. Right, right. He mentioned something here about a phone call that may come into play later, and you're wondering, hmm, who could that be? Hmm. Gee, I wonder. The crowd? Probably oblivious. So, Porch comes in here. Going back to the other version, yeah, another Night One reference here, but this is a four minute version of Porch. Like, when do you get four minute versions of Porch? This was. Only a year before this, this was 10, 12, you know, Atlanta. Like, what is that? 12, 12 minute versions of Porch. Like, yeah, St. Petersburg we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he's doing, he's doing some kind of like scattering, scattering lines here. It's almost like he's saying, check, 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 check. He's almost like doing a mic check or something like that. Yeah, it's just mumbling. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. really make out what it was. Yeah. Right. But it's kind of, it takes you up into where, where the bridge is and, and I, I talked about this in the last episode. Maybe the idea of shortening porch was that maybe they were going to have shorter sets, and, and they did in, in Japan and, and Singapore and some of those places. Some some of those they only had 18 song sets. So how do you get more out of the songs that you want to showcase, like Immortality and Not for You and, and maybe even Black? Uh, but something like Porch, you can just take that chunk out. People have seen that before. Give them something they haven't seen before. And let that be the moment. Yeah, and he and he wasn't doing the the stage climbing and the going up into the rafters and all that, so they didn't have to noodle on it for eight minutes while he went around and you know almost killed himself every night. You know, right. so he, you take that out of the equation, and yeah, there's there's there was no reason for them to just riff on it for 
you know minute after minute while he went off and did his thing so yeah they, they, these are a little tighter versions i would say right yep and you know that, that's not that's not a slight on the version at all because once the bridge sure. transitions and that really ramps up into right before the chorus gets in it's again it's like it's one of those showstopper moments so you you definitely feel it during that jack irons gets jack irons appreciation to throw like this this one we we have no choice <laughs> we have to throw it back to night one because they do a little a little jam to start the show and, and yeah, like yeah. like we mentioned jack this is jack's first kind of introduction to the seattle crowd and and getting uh you know getting acquainted with one another and and really jack at the time you know joining the band felt like this breath of fresh air that they have gone on record saying that he, he saved the band that without him, maybe they don't exist anymore. And I, I think the appreciation all just kind of led to some of these moments, them just kind of doing a little jam where Ed back and forth, just saying, Jack irons, Jack irons, Jack irons. And, uh, you know, Mike at the end is like Zach irons too is <laughs> his son. So just, yeah. just fun moments, fun little moment from this. And, and, you know, uh, just great ode to a guy that was really important and influential on them at the time. And to like people, and just in case people didn't know, like some people might not have known there was a new drummer. You True. Know, if you weren't, if you weren't dialed in, so it's just a, them, a way to them for for them to say, "Hey, here's our new guy. We love him. We appreciate him. You should too." Ending the this little first encore here with only three songs is blood and kind of like night one, you know, blood wasn't really that like show stopping, like big highlight. And again, kind of going back, just wondering if they're in the right headspace for it. If, if this was something that they were really kind of considering, maybe at this point, this was kind of on the side where, all right, maybe this kind of stays in the versus era. It would go forward a little bit more and, and they would play, blood go a lot in 95 a lot in 96 so it's not like they, they forget about it but they have to make decisions at this point and blood was played all the time in the, in the two prior years so this is they have to figure it out yeah still very very good um but yeah you know we you talk about the those iconic performances from soldier field and like when he would we talked about him like shoving stomping the mic stand down right. breaking the stage and everything like some of those some of those performances from that Southeast Asian tour are amazing of this song. But yeah, I think it's just one where they hadn't quite had time to get to all of those earlier verses and, and ten songs with Jack, so he wasn't quite as up to speed on it. I think you know, we do talk about Porch and Blood, like those were two of the showstoppers ninety three, ninety four. Yeah. And they're not quite there here. And I think that's that's due to them just focusing on the Vitality songs with Jack. Cause, cause immortality's there. Uh, Tremor Christ is there, Last Exit is there, Not, not For You is there, there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. but you know they hadn't quite gotten, I think, fully on board with those with kind of the older songs. He he wasn't quite 100 percent on what he was going to do with those, but he he would get there. It's just not there yet. Right. So after that short little encore, and I'm wondering if if it's short because they don't know where Neil is and they don't know what's going on <laughs> yeah. with that. So I'm wondering yeah. if, hey, they have to run backstage and make sure things are okay. So they come out and they play another improv.
bluesy vibe to it. It, it, and it reminds me of something, but I can't put my finger on it. It definitely has the vibe of something I've heard before. Yeah, there's there's not much to this. We talked about you know when we did the we talked about the price of everything a little while ago, and that more being spotty. more of a a fully formed you know piece of music. This is definitely not that. This is definitely an improv, and they're definitely just kind of feeling it out as they go. More spontaneous, absolutely. Yeah. And the next one would be too. So, uh, Satan's Bed. This is not a song that we cover on the podcast very often. It's only been played 38 times, but back to back nights and we get to talk about this song a little bit. John, you have like this relationship with this song where, you know, <laughs> you say that there's never been a perfect version, but I, I think that if there is a perfect version, it's this. There's only this one thing. This is as close as it gets. Yeah, I'll give you that. There's only one thing that's that's keeping it from being a perfect version, and that's there's some versions later where in the chorus Mike would have that solo that he does like within the chorus within the in love already part he does a little solo during that I love when he does that that wasn't fleshed out yet here it sounded like he was a little bit kind of alluding to it in places but I think later on once they were kind of established and you know in more of a a modern era of this song uh, they would bring that in I'm going to put this out as the song appreciation because we just don't we just don't talk about it, but, you know, I don't know if they knew what they had with you. Like, it's another Vitalogy song that's getting thrown out there, but is it a song that really is an Encore 2 song? Is it a song that needs to be packaged in between other Vitalogy songs? I'm not sure with the way that they, they packaged it both nights. I'm not sure if they have it figured out, and it seems because they didn't really play it a whole lot this, this year, the year that they would play it, that they didn't really yeah and it's almost like it's you know it's on the album so we we gotta play it it's that thing but yeah i think it's it's such an awkward riff i think that it's just difficult to play and it's even with the way jack plays i think if you know if they had stuck with it he would have obviously found a a really good place with it but yeah i mean as, as far as it goes this you know these versions you know atlanta these two versions are probably you know, along with self pollution, like those are probably the best versions of it. So put this, put this right up there. Yeah. Again, and again, it, that, it could have been something really cool. Like that, that in love already is is really great, and like it's it could have been such a cool like sing along. It could have turned into a big thing. And but yeah, shortly after this, they just stopped playing it for eight years. Yeah, until the uh, the disaster that is the state college show yeah. that we all know about. But you know they. they figure it out after that but again not one that they bring back too often not one we talk about too often so a little bit highlight just to get the song back in everybody's peripheral so Anybody have any questions before we go? We're going to have to talk next time uh, when we're at the kingdom or something. And uh, says he can't hear shit, so he's not taking questions at this time. I thought he was going to give out his. I thought he was going to get out his phone number. Like I kind of thought so too. Yeah. Radio. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of had that vibe. Like, hey, if you want to talk to me, uh, no, no, Mm -hmm. never mind. (laughs) That's funny you say that. I didn't even write that down. Uh, So that that uh, transitions you into rearview mirror and. You know, again, differing versions from the night before. It's uh, yeah, they they just they just kind of build on the bridge here, didn't they? Yeah, it's not a super long, like you know, seven eight minute version like we get a little bit later on. But yeah, again, it just goes back to Jack and like he's he's so good at that. Like that's his that's his forte. That's his strong. That's his strength. So yeah, you play to the strength. And yeah, Review Mirror is one that yeah it was 
again, dude, that was one where I'm sure he locked onto and was like, yeah, we can do something with this. Obviously, the uh, the cliche that we use on the show, there's not a bad version of Rear View Mirror. Well, this isn't necessarily bad. It doesn't have the elements that really make it Rear View Mirror. There's no that big scream where it leads up to that Rear View. It, it, it's, it's not there. He just kind of either misses it, he, he, you know, he whiffs on it, whatever it was. It, it was just, this is just a transitional kind of version. It's just, it's, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's finding its way. Uh, yeah. And, and it would find its way rather quickly. Like okay. there's no, when, once Jack gets his hands on it, like there's, there's no way he's not going to make this a, uh, a notable song. Again. So, um, but Hey, look, this is our second improv for this encore. And, and this is probably just buying more time for Neil to come out and, and prepare. Uh, and this one's a little bit more experimental. Like, yeah, I, I thought maybe they were channeling a little Sonic Youth here. Did it sound a little Foxy Ma Pendle Mama to you? I thought I... Uh, I wasn't I thinking I, in that I, terms. I it's, it's, and it's, and it's not. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it is, but it, it has that kind of feel to it where they're just kind of like, it's a heavier kind of a jam and it, it's got some of those elements to it. Yeah, I was thinking more like Sonic Youth, just kind of like noise coming out, you know, different noise coming out of a guitar, different noise coming out of the drums. And then I kind of thought like sometimes the Beatles experimental stuff, it kind of had that vibe to it. Uh, those, but those are both influences on Stupid Mop. So yeah, I, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. So, but yeah, I think this is definitely the lesser of the three. Okay, I'll put this in the middle. I- I, I like this one more than the than the boozy one. Okay. But yeah, right. it, but it's it's but it, again, price of everything is just above um, and beyond. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, that'll that'll be in another conversation that we'll have in a minute or so. But uh, Ed says it's been great playing for you, but I'm a little bit confused and then the crowd goes ballistic because next thing you know, here comes Uncle Neil walking out on stage, walk with him. A wild and, Neil Young uh, appears. A wild Neil Young appears, and uh, Ed tells the people in the balcony it's time to stand up. I wonder if that was a thing where nobody was participating up there. Uh, but They were probably we... just tired. <laughs> we're yeah, going right. into Encore 3 here. Yeah. <laughs> and they really milk it, too. Like, it, mm-hmm. you know, this is kind of feels like the, with the imp- improv and stuff like that, that they're just, they're, they're kind of taking their time and making sure he's ready and all that. So... Of course, he's going to come out and they're going to play a song that they had already played because maybe maybe Neil said, hey, I want to play this song. And they weren't going to say no to Neil. And mm-hmm. Neil, Neil probably wasn't there until like 10, 15 minutes before right. Uh, right. <laughs> before going on stage. So uh, right away, right away, you can tell the differences between the two performances. Just the intro. It's very opened up. It takes like a measure or two before it gets really riffy, before it gets into that down, 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 down. Like it, it has more room to breathe, and that's just Neil being able to control the the, the pace of the song and, and like and push it. It's not very often we get to talk about the evolution of a song within one episode. Yeah, right. It's but we're going. Weird. You know, if you you can call this the fourth or the fifth performance, um, whether we're going to count that that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame one that we mentioned before. I mean, but, if we have it, really, we might as well. But really, a, a big jump from the from the third performance to the fourth performance here. I thought with the, that hour or so, they really like, worked <laughs> on it and nailed it, and oh, yeah. really a big jump up there. But no, I like I, I think you're absolutely on track. I think they got there, and they asked Neil what he wanted to play, and he's like, let's do Act of Love. And they're like, we played that one already. So? Yeah, and then they would do, you know, this would rear its head again later this year when they came out and did had to do Rock in the Free World, world twice. <laughs> so, yeah, the, you're getting you're getting double the Neo in 95. But, oh, my God, the, the solos on this version are just bonkers. Oh. Just out there, full-on Neil Young weirdness. Like, yeah, yep. it is it is something to behold. It's just, it's Polish sounding. It's Neil sounding. And, uh, yeah, just a great finish to the show and, and definitely unexpected. Maybe there were some rumblings throughout the neighborhood like, hey, Neil's in town recording the record. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe Neil's coming. And but this kind of felt like Ed decided right before the show or during the show, we're gonna get Neil here. We're gonna make this happen. Oh, but I, I would have loved "I'm the Ocean" or "Throw Your Hatred Down." Like, sure. Cool. Song X. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Uh, all right, that, that takes us to the end of the show, though, and we have a, a lot of good decisions to make, a lot of hard decisions to make. So let's start by making three of them. What are your top three moments oh, from the show? Tough, tough. So many great moments in this. Like I talked about release, amazing, spin the black circles, amazing. Uh, that Both act of loves. But I'm going to go with price of everything, that improv. I love that love that 95 thing that we did go back and listen to that if you're on the patreon that's another thing for people if you're going to join this week go back and find that when it's really really unique and kind of a cool thing that we did um i'll go with lucan being the second ever performance kind of the different lyrics i really like the lyrics to this version i think it really sets a mood and a tone and my number one's tremor christ i think this is the wow. best version of tremor that's- christ that that they've ever played that's interesting because I put Tremor Christ in my top three of the last show, and I have a completely top uh, different top three here. Uh, and I actually thought our top threes were going to be exactly the same, which is just speaks to how good this show was. Um, mine, I, I, one of one of mine is is the same as yours. Uh, Price of Everything is fantastic. I think that at the end of the day could end up being one of my favorite Im- improvs that they've done. And it's one of those things I, I you have to just sit down and just study all the improvs, listen to them and kind of almost do an evolution of the improvs <laughs> there. There's an idea for you guys. So uh, yeah, I, it just feels polished. It feels so much mature, mature compared to what they were doing in 94. Just it's, it's got a feel. It's got that same feel of like I got shit or long road where it's wide open and you get yeah. that feeling of like, being out like in the in the northwest or the southwest where you're out in this open space and like yeah I, I get you on that yeah and my other two moments here uh immortality is fan freaking tastic just ramping up at the end and then just letting it go and and smoothing it out at, at the end of the song was was whew, man that's a ride that that version and uh I, I have to get any time I hear the album intro for go. I got to give it some credit because it's not every day that you're going to get something like that, especially, you know, Jack wasn't on verses. So, Hey, he's got a, okay, well, what, what'd they do on the record again? All right, well, I'll figure it out and then let's go into it. Sure. And how about that? And we, neither of us had active loves. Neither of had kids yeah, are all right. That's, Whipping's great. Like this is a sign of a good not, show. Not for you. Corduroy. Yeah. I made a statement in episode one in night one that I like Night One better. You did. I think I like aspects of Night One better. I think that this is a better overall show. I think that Ed's vocals were better in Night One in in points. I think he got better as the Night One along at this show. Uh, I think that Jack was just a different version of Jack. He was more, maybe he was more polished in Night Two, but like just raw as shit on Night One. But... That's not not to take anything away from this show, too, because as the more that I talked about it and I I listened to it in in pieces. So, of course, that's going to kind of take away uh, some of the the flow. Um, I really did like it. And since I'm talking about it here, I'm just going to I'm going to give them the tie. I I gave the last one a nine. I'm going to give this one a nine as well. I think they're they're right next to each other. There's things that I things that I like from both shows and there's things that all right, well, maybe it didn't work, but of course they were trying things at the time. This is a ten out of ten for me. This one's ten. Yeah. Okay. I gave I gave nine and a half on the other one. I think this is this is a ten out of ten with all the great moments, everything that was going on, the the crowd, the improvs, the early versions, all the vitology stuff just kicks ass the so many so much good stuff in this and i i went back and counted i've only given 19 <laughs> tens on this show so far so i've got a long way to go for my top 50 well one, so, one of yours was like a, a 25 wasn't it didn't you give charlotte a, a 37 like a or something uh, yeah yeah, right. <laughs> yeah whatever that was but we'll call that a 10 if we're if you're doing the official you know if you're doing the official accounting of it but yeah i think i think this is this is a 10 out of 10 this is a fantastic show great listen just so many great moments that make you sit up and, t- and take notice. And I, I love Jack. You know, Jack's my favorite drummer that played with him. I think he was a 
just above and beyond. And it's as great as Cameron is, as as great as Dave was for the stuff that he played on. I think that the Jack era is is was something special, and I think this this definitely shows that. Yeah, uh, I I agree. Look, I I I can't say that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna kind of you know just be lame and and say that out of the three I like equal parts from each of them and i don't have one that's superior to all uh but i do get a really good feel when i listen to jack shows that i don't necessarily get when i listen to dave shows and matt shows are just matt shows just feel like normal pearl jam to me that just feels yeah i mean like matt's good at everything he does everything yeah, well right exactly they call him a machine for a reason yeah. so uh, but you definitely just get this it's a special vibe coming from everywhere when when uh when you listen to jack shows different from the other ones so okay uh that's that's the show that's the episode let's tee you up for what we got going on next week i believe it's a patreon request i believe the patron uh is going to join us for that and his name is david ritter and he is a ten dollar donor for from the horizon tier and his choice of episode hey we've done a lot of 90s stuff lately we got to balance it out 2014 we got it we got to go back to only a couple of years ago and going we're back gonna to do, the future exactly and uh we're we're gonna do cincinnati from 2014 which is a really really good show that is a good show yeah they opened they opened the tour with that and uh they busted out a a bunch of things that they weren't playing at the time. Some, some covers in that, uh, of tremendous version, probably the best version of one of, one of the songs that's in there. I actually used for, for my wish list for uh, Pearl jam radio. So that we're going to be able to talk about that. And that's going to be a lot of fun to talk about. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all the great stuff that happened there. And if you liked what you listened to here, obviously we mentioned it a hundred times, there's a part one to this. It's uh, over on Patreon. It's night one from this. They kind of go hand in hand. If you just want to listen to the night two, that's your prerogative. We understand. But night one is over on Patreon. It only costs a dollar to join up. And hey, you get to talk Pearl Jam with a bunch of great, intelligent, intuitive Pearl Jam fans that really understand this band and are, have like this knack for history. And that's what... You know, that's the stuff that we've been talking about over on Patreon. That's the stuff we've been talking about over at the Discord as well. So get involved. We want you involved. And, come, uh, come nerd out with us because that's what we do. Exactly, yeah. If, if, if you listen to the show to kind of get your fix for that, like getting in touch with all the people that are within this this inner circle i suppose i don't like the 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 term inner circle because i let anybody in that wants to be in uh that's that's our that's our invitation if you want to be invited into this this circle that we've created that's how you do it come join patreon come join discord so all right i think we can close this one out out this may be the end we're here but not for much longer and although we may be parting ways i miss you already i miss you always that was two episodes, and you might not realize it, but we recorded it all in one shot. So we are shot, and it's time for us to go, but we'll be back next week. Cincinnati 2014. See you then. Jack Irons. Sing with Jack me. Irons. We love Jack Irons. Jack Irons. Oh, yes, we do. Jack Irons. We love Jack Oh yes we do Come on you fuckers I love Jack Irons We do Jack Irons